What did you like doing when you were a kid? All my life I've been in love with nature and being outside and being outdoors. So I was fortunate that my family were both Saskatchewan farmers uh, in the, the southern part of Saskatchewan. So during the summer months, we'd always be on the farms, uh, you know, hanging out with all the animals and, you know, livestock. But still, it's just out in these big fields with animals. And then, yeah, and then from there, when I was four years old, my family moved from southern Saskatchewan to up to the high Arctic to Baffin Island. And how was that? It was amazing. And if you don't know where Baffin Island is, you get on an airplane in Chicago and you fly straight north for three and a half hours uh, and you land on this island that's windswept with no trees, that's icy and cold and it's the barren lands and uh, the views are great because there's nothing to block it. You know, you just could see forever in every direction. And as a kid to be out playing with 24 hours of light where you can see all night, you know, and, and to be, your parents wouldn't worry about you because there was no real major threat or concern, you know, in a community like that. Everybody took care of everybody. And so you could be out as long as you wanted without mom and dad uh, yelling for you? Yeah, I mean, mostly. I mean, there's two phases to my life. You know, living in uh, Akala was one thing. That was a bigger city. It had sort of more threats that you get with a city with a population of, you know, bringing in drugs and booze and all those problems that start to come into a community like that. But when we moved to another tiny community called Kimmerud, when we moved there, it was Lake Harbor. Um, my mom was a school teacher. My dad was a... Uh, settlement manager at the time, heavy duty mechanic as well. It really was the true sense of the word community where it was rude to knock on anyone's door back then. You never knocked on anyone's door if you wanted to go into their house. It was, it, it's, it's such an open door policy that you would just walk into any home any time of day. Really? Yeah. You would just walk into any room. There would often be a seal carcass in the middle of the, uh, the kitchen floor or a caribou carcass or there'd be soup in, on the on the stove and you would just, if you're hungry, you would eat, you would talk or you would relax and you'd go back outside and keep playing. And if you wanted to go carve soapstone, you would go into someone's carving shed and you would carve up some soapstone. I mean, it was just, just a really beautiful sharing community. So when you're seven, you moved to this community that has less than 200 people. Um, in addition to what you just mentioned, just describe what the environment was like there. It was, a town that was still very set in its traditional ways. We never had a telephone, we never had a television, we didn't have radio, we obviously didn't have computers, we didn't have sort of anything that would want to keep you inside the house. Our whole connection and the connection of that community and, and that world was to the land, was to being out on the water, to being out on the sea ice too. Uh, so that's where as kids we would play, that's where the the elders and the hunters would get food for the community. Everything was in this, this outdoor world. How easy was it to get supplies? Well, your supplies came once a year by ship. Um, you know, so you would order all your dried food for the year. Uh, it would come by ship. Um, they would drop 2,000 pounds of groceries on the shore in, in, in August or early, early September when the icebreakers could finally get through, drop off these big pallets of food, and it was always a st stressful time to make sure that you did your shopping right. You didn't forget anything off your shopping list. But I remember my parents discussing, how much did you get enough, did you get enough cereal? Did you get enough canned whatever? You know, I mean, I grew up on powdered milk. You could buy some fresh groceries, but it was you know, 6 to $8 in 1970 for a head of lettuce, and it was $6 for a little jug of milk back then. You just couldn't afford it. So we lived on dried food and powdered food and canned food. Uh, what kind of pets did you have? <laughs> uh, didn't have any traditional pets. Uh, we had uh, often the Inuit hunters would bring over and drop off a baby seal. Uh, if they went out and got the mom and tragically, you know, they, they would eat it. But if they found this, the pup, they would keep it alive and bring it back to us kids to, to play with. And I had a pet seagull that I had for a long time. His name was Sammy the seagull. And the poor bird, um, he had a broken wing, and which is how he became my pet. And I really protected him and took care of him and loved Sammy. And, and I, but I really wanted more than anything was for Sammy to fly. And on the weekends, you know, when I had some time, I would take Sammy up to the top of a cliff. And I'm like, you can do it, Sammy. I didn't know anything about broken bones or broken wings back then. But I just through sheer emotion and cheering, I'd huck Sammy off a 400 foot tall cliff and oh, watch no. poor Sammy do this death, death spiral back down to the earth and <laughs> poof, hit the. <laughs> hit the ground with a thud and I'm like, oh no, Sammy, and I'd run down there like, we can do it, Sammy, take poor Sammy back up to the top of the cliff and huck him again. And um, So I had Sammy for a long time and <laughs> fed and that, him. That's not animal. <laughs> <laughs> so that's called true love for an animal. And um, yeah, and then tragically, somebody in town got the only cat in town and the only cat ate the only bird that couldn't fly. And, and so I had to say goodbye to Sammy, buried Sammy, but yeah, it's just, just my childhood. So 
you know, when you were growing up, there were times when there were 100 mile an hour winds, it's 30 below zero. And here you'd be running outside, burying yourself in the snow and sitting there for hours. Um, why and what would you do? <laughs> um, you know, you need to entertain yourself. So I love to, if you realize the insulating property of snow, it was just fun to be out in a howling blizzard. Like we did have wind. Uh, I remember one storm, the wind was over 100 miles an hour for a week, and I was a kid, and we just would love to sneak outside and bury ourselves in the snow, and we often did that, just to see who could last the longest. You know, kids have to compete, and what do you compete with when you have no Xbox or PlayStation? You, you bury yourself in a snowbank and see who can last the longest before you, you freeze and have to go back in the house. Uh, but yeah, we had some bad storms. To one storm that several people died, and. Um, uh, where people were lost on the land and I, even my dad and the community went out to try and we couldn't leave our house we had a two-story townhouse uh, and you could not see out of the front window because the snowbank was so high that it was over 20 feet tall blocking the front window in order to get out of the house we had to tunnel uh, a tunnel that was under deep deep snow just to get out of our house uh, and so when we finally the storm subsided we had to basically dig out this whole community um, and I know that they went even to looking for places like the correction center. You know, the police station was a one-level building that was they were looking for it, but they were sitting on top of it on with, in their snowmobiles, like saying, "I know it's got to be here," but the complete you know jail was buried by snow.